Good morning, Ed here from Crystal Clear Aquatics. What a beautiful morning it is. The last couple of weeks we seem to have had nothing but endless rain and wind, so it's quite nice to have a, a welcome break from that. Although it is a little bit chilly. Now I often get asked on my channel, lots of questions on how to clean out ponds, best times of year to clean out ponds, what kind of equipment's involved in cleaning out ponds. And today I happen to be visiting a regular client of mine whose pond I service periodically. And today we're going to be doing a full drain and clean on this pond. So it's an ideal opportunity for me to show you what's involved and the kind of equipment that I use. And I think this pond is going to represent most average domestic ponds very well. It's a goldfish pond, it's about 500 gallons in volume and it's got a pretty basic um, but popular filtration system, a pressurised filter. So I think this represents most garden ponds fairly typically. Now I think one of the most important questions you need to ask yourself is why are you cleaning the pond out in the first place? Uh, I spent many years working in retail advising customers on what to do with their ponds and one of the most common things I would hear would be people coming in and saying to me that I've got blanket weed in my pond or my pond is green, should I clean it? And quite often people would empty, scrub the pond liner and refill the pond completely with tap water only to find that in a few weeks time the pond's gone green and blanket weed has resumed. So algae is not a reason to clean out a pond, that's an entirely different problem, something that I've covered in other videos and something that I will mention again. But the reason why you would want to drain and clean a pond is to get rid of the build-up of silt and sediment that accumulates in the bottom of all ponds. Even if you've got filtration systems, sediment is still going to slowly accumulate. A certain amount of alluvium or silt is not a problem and in fact can be beneficial for many wildlife ponds. It provides a bit of uh, refuge for amphibians and for overwintering creatures in the pond. But if you end up with too much silt in the bottom of a pond, it can harbour harmful bacteria. It can become anaerobic and start to release harmful gases into the pond, um, which are going to affect water quality. And it's going to release nutrients into the pond, which is going to encourage algae to grow. The only way to get rid of large amounts of silt in the bottom of the pond effectively is really to dredge it. Now, this is a pond that I service sort of two or three times a year, spring, summer and autumn. And over the last few years, I've been coming along with my pond vacuum doing a partial water change, removing some of the accumulated silt and sediment and just doing general maintenance on the pond. But we've never quite got this pond polished, not crystal clear. There's a lot of sediment on the bottom of the pond and there's a lot of livestock in here. And it gets to a state where there's just too much muck in the pond for the filtration to cope. The livestock, as they swim around in the pond, will stir it up and get that silt into suspension and it will cloud the water and the filter won't cope. So on average, every sort of five to eight years or so, it's worth fully draining a pond down and giving it a thorough clean. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So I think for most average ponds up to about this kind of size, a competent DIYer, a homeowner, could tackle a pond clean themselves quite comfortably if they're willing to get a bit mucky and wet and uh, have got a few basic pieces of equipment. Um, probably most importantly is going to be, of course, a pond pump to get the pond emptied and drained. If it's a really small pond, you could use scoops and buckets just to bail out the pond water. Um, a jet wash or a hose to get the pond clean and to wash off some of the silt and the sediment that's going to have collected on the pond liner. Uh, holding tanks for livestock. I've got a, a nice container here that I use to put most smaller fish into when I'm cleaning out ponds. If I'm doing bigger ponds or koi uh, ponds, then I have some bigger holding tanks and frame tents that I'll set up to hold the fish. But for this pond with goldfish, a little tank like this is absolutely fine. Uh, if you haven't got access to a holding tank like this, then again, just buckets, crates, containers, a small kid's paddling pool will be absolutely fine. A couple of nets to hook out some of the fish. Uh, if you're doing this in the height of summer and it's really hot, you're gonna wanna aerate the holding tank for the livestock. Today, Six degrees, November, uh, I'm not too concerned about that. Although depending on how many fish I pull out from the pond, I have got an air pump as a backup, just in case this tank gets a little bit overcrowded, in which case I'll turn on an air pump. For me, probably the most useful piece of kit is a pond vacuum. This is something that you might not have access to. So again, you're just gonna have to roll your sleeves up, get a bit mucky, it's gonna take you a bit longer, and you're gonna have to use brushes and scoops and buckets to hook out the silt and the muck. But once I've emptied the pond out of all the pond water, I'll then use the pond vacuum to get rid of some of the sort of wet uh, silt. And then when I get down to the thicker deposits, I'll do that by hand. So a pond vacuum is really useful. You can hire them, so it's well worth doing so if you've got one in your local area. 
buckets. You can never have too many buckets when you're cleaning out ponds. Make sure you've got plenty of those. And just some very simple plastic scoops like this or a dustpan and brush um, used to bail out some of the water and the silt is also really, really useful. Personal kind of protection, always wear gloves. A pair of long kind of gauntlets like this are quite useful if you're cleaning out a really, really dirty pond. A pair of pond waders, obviously, unless you're doing this in summer and you don't mind getting too wet. Um, but definitely protect your hands. If you're cleaning up particularly a fish pond and there's livestock in the pond, there is always a risk of harmful bacteria harboured in the silt and the muck from the bottom. And the last thing you want to do is to contract something nasty. So wear gloves. Now holding tanks is something that you might not have access to. And one of the most important aspects of pond cleaning is trying to reserve as much of the original pond water as possible. Um, the last thing you want to do is to empty out the pond fully, get rid of all of the water and then refill it with tap water. Even if the water is mucky or appearance is dirty and brown, there's still a huge amount of benefit within that water and you'll certainly want to try and save at least 50% of the original pond water and more if you can. If you haven't got access to holding tanks, then kids paddling pools or frame pools are probably the cheapest and easiest way of retaining large volumes of water. Now I've got these very convenient portable storage tanks. These are called onion tanks. Um, they're flexible, nice and easy to carry, uh, and they simply pop up using some kids floats, some noodles, which are really buoyant. And as the tank is filled with water, this collar floats sitting on top of the water, lifting up this structure of the holding tank to create the shape of kind of an onion. A really great way of being able to hold quite large volumes of water quite easily. It's a bit of a waiting game when you're cleaning out ponds at this stage of the game. I'm just kind of hanging around waiting for the pond to empty. So it's a good opportunity to get yourself all prepared for when the pond is emptied. I've got jet washers that need to be rigged up, hoses to pull out, my vacuum to set up. So I'll get all those little jobs done now so that when the pond is empty, I'm in a position to just jump on it and start cleaning. Right, the pond is nearly emptied. I've just gone round and removed some of the water lilies and de-leafed, removed most of the foliage. At this time of year, I'd do that anyway because the lilies are going to die back for winter. But it's going to make it much easier for me to deal with the plants and for me to see where all the fish are. And it's only now that I'm going to start to remove the fish. It might look a little bit distressing if you're not used to working with fish, seeing them in the shallows sort of flapping around like this or on their side, but they're absolutely fine. And the biggest issue with the fish when you're cleaning out pond is stress. So we want to try and get the fish out as quickly and efficiently as possible. If you're chasing them around when the pond is full with a couple of nets, all you're going to do is potentially knock them about and stress them out. So this is the quickest and easiest method. I'll get them out, put them into the holding tank, and then I'll vacuum out the last of the water. There's bound to be a few stragglers left in the pond that I'll deal with. Now, if you can, it's always easy here to have an extra pair of hands so that you can pass the net out rather than have to climb out of the pond each time, which is what I'm going to have to do. Right, that's most of the fish out of the pond. There's a few left in there but there's a lot less and I feel it's much safer for me to get into the pond now without fear of uh, standing and squishing on the fish, which of course I don't want to do. So the next stage for me now is to get rid of the rest of the water that's in the pond. So I should be using my trusty Hawaza Pond Vac. This is the Pond Vac 5. Uh, if you haven't got access to a pond vacuum, then this is at the stage you're gonna have to roll your sleeves up and start bailing and bucketing and good luck with that. Um, this water I'm not gonna save. This is a, a much sort of muckier, dirtier water. So this is gonna get pumped out and put onto the flower beds. And then when I get down to the last of the thicker stuff, that's when I'll roll my sleeves up and I'll get my scoops and buckets and start hooking that out. So we're at the messy part. This isn't terrible, but there's a huge amount of gravel and muck. I think what's happened over the years as a fish have got into the lily baskets and have removed a lot of the gravel and the what was originally aquatic compost that it's now just settled in the bottom of the pond 
created a, a layer of debris that's allowed the roots of the water lily over the years to start to root into and it's just created this kind of massive plant at the bottom which has allowed the fish to rummage around in here stirring up muck and it's become a bit of a silt trap. So we've got to get rid of all of this. I've got a bucket with a bit of water in so I can hang on to any stragglers that might still be floundering around in the pond. There's always going to be one, I can assure you. Get my gloves on and we'll start hooking this out. Now I mentioned at the beginning of this video, one of the questions people often ask me is, when's the best time of year to clean out a pond? That does depend what kind of pond you have. Uh, if you've got predominantly a wildlife pond, or you expect a lot of amphibians in your pond, which are going to be spawning during the spring, it's probably best to avoid kind of March, April, May, June, when either they're going to be spawning in the pond and we don't want to disturb them, or you're going to have lots of tadpoles in the pond, which are going to be very difficult to salvage. But mid to late summer, uh, most of them should have gone. It should be a lot easier then to get the pond emptied and cleaned. Likewise, if you've got a fish pond or a koi pond, and you've got livestock in the pond, you don't really want to be disturbing the fish when the water temperature gets below about five degrees. I mean, certainly it's too cold for me to be getting in the pond at that temperature as well. Uh, today, daytime temperature is sort of six or seven. Uh, it's probably about 10 to 12 degrees now, and water temperature is hovering around 10 or fractionally below, so this is okay. It's a nice dry day for it as well, which is always quite nice. Uh, but when that water drops below five, once we start getting a few regular frosts, the fish, they're going to sit at the bottom of the pond. They're not really going to want to be disturbed. So again, avoid kind of the depths of winter if you can help it. Now, if you come across any life at this stage in the pond, dragonfly larvae, uh, water beetle larvae, frogs, newts, um, separate bucket, hang on to as much of that as you can. <laughs> it's not every day I find that in the bottom of a pond. And I'm glad I found it before I trodden on it, because that, that's quite a sharp knife. I think the best thing I've ever encountered at a pond was, I was asked by one of my clients to drain a pond and look for their car keys, which their, ch their children had thrown into the pond. <laughs> Luckily I was successful, we found them, and miraculously they still worked as well. Well, I'll get all this debris out and then I can start jet washing the liner and giving it a thorough clean. Nearly there. And I think the first thing that strikes me is just how well this pond liner has been put in. Whoever did this did a fantastic job. Now these plastic scoops, as I say, invaluable. I got these on eBay, uh, other marketplaces available, I'm sure. And they are just basic plastic boat bales, uh, a couple of quid each. It's a shame they're not high vis, they're very easy to get lost in the pond, um, but they're fantastic. Now before I start jet washing, I think I'm going to take the opportunity to tackle the plants. We've got some iris, some marsh marigold, some variegated acorus. All of this is going to get cut back, which I would do anyway for winter, because we want to try and prevent as much organic material sort of decomposing and breaking down in the pond. Again, if you've got a wildlife pond, it's nice to leave an area of your pond untouched for winter. So leave some of those marginal plants and just let them naturally break down. That's going to provide a bit of natural vegetation and cover for any sort of hibernating creatures that will be in your pond. Uh, but in this pond, there's nothing here, just the fish. So all of this is going to get cut back. Now, before I do anything else, it's 11 Z's and I'm starving. Right, that was nice. It's filled a hole, but I'm getting cold and the days at this time of year are very short. So I need to crack on with this as quick as I can. The Acorus, this is Acorus calamus variegatus or dwarf Acorus. This is actually an evergreen plant. It wouldn't necessarily have to be cut back for winter. And if it's looking nice and tidy, leave it. It's nice to have a little bit of winter um, interest. But every two or three years, it's worth cutting it back completely. After a while, you start to get a lot of thatch and sort of brown debris growing through it. And as hard as you try to rake it out, it won't come out. So cutting it all back will mean that next season you get all the new green growth. But here, it's really broken out through the basket and creating these great big overhangs. Again, a small amount of that, not a problem, even desirable if you want to have somewhere for the fish to hide away. 
but I'm going to take the opportunity to thin this out a little bit and get rid of half of this. Now the rest of these marginal plants are well anchored. I've got no concerns about their baskets. So apart from having a tidy up, these aren't going to get split and potted on, just the water lilies. So I'll get this finished off and then we'll get the jet wash out. So all the plants cut back, now it's time for a rinse. I'm using a jet wash, but I'm using a nozzle which is specific for car washing. So it's a nice soft spray. You don't want to go too hard with the jet wash and a pond liner, particularly if it's an old pond liner and particularly if it's a PVC. You get too close, you're going to damage it and that's going to cause major headaches. So either very far away with a jet wash, just giving it a very light rinse. If you've got a nozzle where you can change the pressure, put it on a lighter pressure or preferably use a nozzle designed for delicate washing like car washing nozzles like this one. Now you could argue that this stage of the cleaning isn't overly important. The bulk of the debris has been taken out. You might well be introducing dirty water back into the pond. So what's the point of cleaning the liner? It's only going to get green anyway. And I'm not really trying to clean off that patina of algae because I don't want to be getting too close to the liner. Um, well, the main reason for doing so is actually to inspect the pond liner. It's not often that you're going to get a chance to see the pond empty. So getting the pond properly clean and using a jet wash is a really, really good way of giving the liner a proper inspection, checking for any damage, any small holes. And in fact, as you are looking at the spray on the jet wash, if there is any damage or holes to the pond liner, that will be very noticeable on that white spray. So this is quite a good tool if you're very careful and you're watching the nozzle. If you do see any holes in the pond liner, the jet wash is going to pick it up. So for me, this is why I want to give the liner a, a good clean. It's so I can give it a thorough inspection. Another thing that's well worth doing is you may well have moved into a property that had an existing pond and you've never seen it empty. So take some photos. You may well not see the pond empty again in the time that you're with the pond. So it's a good opportunity to take some pictures so that you can remind yourself in the future of where the shallows, the contours and certain aspects and features of the pond are. Right, pond clean, liner inspected, no damage, very good quality lining. So we're at the stage of filling the pond. Well, actually, no, we're not. Don't get too carried away. Don't start filling the pond immediately. The next thing I want to do is if you've got any deep water marginal plants that are going to be in the depths of the pond, like water lilies, tackle them now, get them in the pond whilst it's dry and then start filling. It's an awful lot easier to deal with those plants when the pond is empty. If you get too carried away and the pond's really deep, you're not quite sure necessarily where the flat and level areas are for the pond and it might be quite difficult to position your lilies. So do that bit now. So I'm just going to tackle this water lily very quickly. I'm not surprised now having seen all of that progressive growth that are sort of rooted into the bottom of the pond. I'm not surprised how overgrown the pond have been during the summer with water lilies. And we only need a fraction of this potted on to create a nice big plant. The old basket's got very brittle over time, so I'm just going to break that away. And it's just one solid mass of roots and rhizome. And I'm very simply Using a little folding saw, I'm going to chop away at the outer edges. That's the, the best growth of the water lily, um, kind of the newest growth, which is starting to spread. And all you want is a chunk of rhizome, that thick uh, rhizome root, a little bit of white tap root, and this growing eye here, this tip where the pads are going to grow from and that is going to produce a nice plant. I've salvaged some of the gravel from the bottom of the pond. I'm going to reuse that as, as the base of the planting medium. And then I'll finish it off with a layer of 10 mil gravel and then a layer of slightly larger 20 mil or small cobbles on top of that to prevent those very large goldfish from getting into the basket and hoiking all that gravel back out into the pond. Now I won't go into too much detail with this. If you've seen any of my videos before, I'm always going on about how to pot on water lilies. But if you're not sure, check out some of my previous videos and you'll see lots and lots of detail on how to pot on water lilies, excuse me. Right, that's all I need. 
the rest of that is not going to go back in the pond. And all I'll do very simply is push these rhizomes into the gravel, making sure that this growing tip here is at the surface or just fractionally proud of the gravel. You don't want to bury this section. Right, let's get some more gravel to go in there. So this is a very large variety of water lily. And I'm going to put it down at the deepest section of the pond, filled it up with a final layer of some 10mm shingle, giving it a rinse because it's a bit dusty. And I'm now just going to place a few small cobbles and stones around the rhizomes of the lily, covering the gravel, just to try and prevent some of those bigger goldfish, because some of the bigger ones are, you know, this kind of size, quite big mouths. They're going to want to root around in here and very quickly, we'll be back to where we were before all that gravel sitting in the bottom of the pond. But it's very important you don't want to cover those growing tips with bigger stones because that is going to prevent some of the growth. Right, that's another job done. I'm now ready to start filling the pond. So that's both tanks emptied, the pond filled up. I've got the new pond pump wired up and running, filtration cleaned out, and that's back up and running. So the bulk of the job has been done now. And now it's really just tidying up, of which I've got an awful lot to do. I seem to have spread myself out over the lawn quite a lot today. So I'll get all this tidied up. And then the last thing I want to do is to add some treatments to the pond and to give the pond a final skim and just a general tidy. And then I'll pop back in a couple of weeks time and see how the pond is looking. It should be much, much clearer than it has been for the last few years. Just so pleased it's been such a nice dry day. It's been gorgeous today. A little bit chilly when I stop, but I'm not going to complain. Now I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you all for watching my videos, for all my new subscribers. Massive thank you to um, Tony Piscatelli. Bless you. Every time I release a new video, you watch it and you're very kind and put a donation on the Super Chats. Thank you very much. It means an awful lot. Thank you. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel. There's an awful lot of content that you might not be aware of and might not have seen. It really helps the channel. And if you like anything pond related, then go and check it out. So it's the exciting bit, it's putting the fish back into the pond. Now herein lies the beauty of being able to hang on to as much of the original pond water as possible. All these guys can go back in their pond without any concerns for treating the new tap water, dechlorinating, um, conditioning the water whatsoever. The pond balance is exactly as it was before because they've gone back into the same water. Now, I always like to try and count what goes back into the pond so we just get a rough idea of kind of quantities. Uh, I'm already thinking there's a few too many fish in this pond. It may be in the future that we think about rehoming some of them, although they're extremely healthy. Uh, I'm hazarding a guess at around 100 to 120 fish, but we'll see. And there's some beautiful fish in here. Just grab a couple of these. So some of these goldfish are lovely. You don't really get an idea of the depth of the fish until you see them out of water. Look at that, beautiful. A nice lemon goldfish. Beautiful yellow colours on the head there. A long day. Well that's it, jobs are good and pond's clean. This won't need to get done again for at least another five years and because I come and service the pond and do quite frequent vacuuming, probably 10 years. Uh, 198 fish. 
that's 100 fish at least, really too many for a pond of this kind of size. I mean, they're very healthy uh, and they're still breeding, which is often a telltale sign of whether or not the pond is, is really overcrowded. Goldfish have got this remarkable ability that when the pond gets really, really heavily crowded, they'll stop breeding. There's not enough natural resources to sustain beyond a certain population. If only human beings could do that as well. Um, however, I think when this is clear, it's going to look very busy and it's certainly going to put a bigger drain on the filtration system. So perhaps next season when it warms up a little bit, uh, we might be able to find some donor ponds to rehome a few of these fish, just to keep the numbers down a little bit. Now the other thing I like to do when I'm cleaning a pond is to add some blanket weed treatment. This is where I'm going to go into the pond. Ooh, very nearly. Just perch on the edge. Now, the other thing I like to do when I'm cleaning ponds, just to finish off, is to add some blanket weed treatment. This is Blanket Answer, a cloverleaf blanket answer, uh, a real staple for ponds. It's been around for years and it's fantastic at preventing and getting rid of blanket weed issues. And although that I've used the vast majority of this pond is the original pond water, there has been a, a reasonable top up with tap water and that might introduce a few nutrients back into the pond, which could cause a bit of a blanket weed explosion. So to nip that in the bud, I'll just add a little bit of this. And then the last thing I'll do is to just give the surface of the pond a bit of a skim to get rid of some of this debris that's floating on the top. Now this really clouds the pond up, but it will settle in clear in a couple of days. It's always advisable not to feed the fish for a couple of days after you've drained the pond. It's a little bit stressful for the fish. And when fish are stressed, they won't digest food properly. What comes out the other end might be a little bit more polluting to a pond. So it's safest just not to feed them for a couple of days after you've done some activity like this. Right, that's it. End of a long day. It's a lot of work to tackle on your own. But it is doable. And if you're going to drain and clean your pond, I hope you found some useful hints and tips here to help you along the way. I'll pop back in a couple of weeks once this is clear to have a good look. I'm sure it will be crystal clear. We'll be able to finally see right down to the bottom and really see that shoal of fish. And it should be a lot easier now in the future to maintain the filtration system and keep it nice and clean. I'm Ed from Crystal Clear Aquatics. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next pond. Cheers. <laughs>